depression, you tend to, he thought of people who were depressed as people who are just like disheveled, um, tired, maybe miss work. Depression in him showed up as working really long hours and exercising four or five times a, hours a day, trying to kill himself on the treadmill. So that's how depression showed up in him. So just try to maybe use this as an example of taking a look at your, expect, your, your impressions of what you think depression is. And because now we have to really be on the lookout for things like that showing up. Do you have an employee that is just working 24 seven and says, oh, it's no problem, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, and not dealing with their feelings. Captain Cruder eventually, um, while he was in that job, spoke out about his depression. And I know that he saved many lives because he admitted it and he talked about it. And that took a lot of courage and he was vulnerable because people are looking at him, um, you know, thinking that that's not how you're supposed to act in the military. Um, so I admire Captain Cruder for his courage and you can listen to that episode. Another one, Steve Iceland is a retired that I interviewed. He's the second interview that I did. He's a retired Navy captain and, at the, and, and he's also a senior executive. I met him when I worked in the uh, Pentagon and he was the head uh, or the senior executive under the political appointee at installations and logistics for the Navy. But when he left the Navy as a captain, he had several job offers. I think he even had a job, but all of a sudden he said it just happened and he didn't even know what depression was and he didn't know what was happening. But all of a sudden things just went really downhill for him until he, in about three weeks that that happened and he was feeling like he couldn't care for his family. I probably feeling imposter syndrome, all this stuff. And then he got in his son's car that he knew was not a very safe car. And he drove around the Beltway in DC with the intention of killing himself. He drove for 300 miles and he didn't do it. And then his wife approached him, confronted him, had a difficult conversation with him and he owned up to it. And now he speaks out um, a lot and helps people through it. And he started uh, an organization in DC. I can't remember the name of the chapter, but they didn't even have that chapter. And so he wasn't embarrassed at work to talk about um, when he was in SES, he talked about his depression and how he was still dealing with it. He wasn't embarrassed to talk about that. One thing that, one tip that he gave in his interview that I think you could, we could all use at work and at home is he said, instead of asking somebody how they're doing, how are you feeling? And, and let me just highlight that I listened to a Brene Brown podcast where she was talking with the author of this book, Permission to Feel. Most people can't identify their feelings. And a lot of times we can't, we can't name them. And we can't name our feelings, the feelings of other people. Like you might see somebody like this and you think they're angry, but they may not be angry. They may be defensive. You know, so we assume, we portray what we think on other people. So that's something to be aware of. You know, to be an authentic leader, you really need to be self-aware. It starts with you, it starts with us. So this guy said that like, he's done a lot of research and most people can only name like three feelings. They can't even name their feelings. And this isn't taught. It's not taught in school. It's not taught at home that much. I know when I was growing up, uh, when the three of us, my brother, my sister and I got in trouble, we all had to go and stand in a corner in the hallway. So I'm standing in the corner facing the hallway but I'm not learning how to identify my feelings and to deal with them. And somebody else that I interviewed said, if you don't deal with your feelings, you send them to the basement and they go and lift weights. And at some point you're gonna to have to deal with them. So are you, are you dealing with your feelings? Are your people dealing with their feelings? Because people problems are the main, people issues are the main place where leaders of companies probably spend a lot of time. You've got people underperforming, overperforming, not performing, not showing up. It's all people issues. So Steve talked about, instead of asking somebody how they are, how are you today? I mean, when you ask somebody, how, how are you? Typically when we ask, and maybe this is an American culture, it's like, we really don't want to know. We don't want to know how they're doing. We just, you expect them to say, I'm fine and go on. 
So Steve said, ask somebody, what's your number? So on a scale of one to 10, what's your number today? And then it's a kind of an easier way of saying, being vulnerable and saying, I'm really not feeling that good. If you, and if you're a three every day for two weeks and normally you're an eight, something's wrong. So I think in this day and age with the COVID virus and people working from home and people stressed, we need to ask people what their number is and we need to have real conversations with people about how they're feeling. And I'm not saying that it needs to consume everything and take over and that, but you got people want to feel here, heard. Connection is a big thing with humans. We, that's why we go to church. That's why we hug. That's why we shake hands. That's why we're all just so stressed right now because we're not having that connection. It's not quite the same over Zoom. So, and all of those issues, if they're not addressed, they lead to lack of productivity. So that's what I got out of Steve Iceland's <clears throat> episode is, you know, he asked people, what's your number? And he is comfortable sharing what he's been through. Um, so as leaders, we, we need to lead by example. I interviewed two other people that felt like they could not show up as their authentic selves at work. And whether you agree or disagree with, um, you know, transgenders in the military or um, gays in the military. My point isn't that, and I'm not trying to make a political point. I'm just saying that my friend from the Naval Academy, Zoe Dunning, could not be her authentic self in the military because it was don't ask, and, and then the don't ask, don't tell got passed and everything. So, okay, don't ask, don't tell, you know, just don't let us know you're gay. And that's fine. That is not a culture of authenticity. And she fought it, and I'm pretty proud of her. She stood by President Obama when he repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So I interviewed her in the podcast, uh, in, in one of my episodes. I also interviewed Paula Nera. Paula was Paul when she went to the Naval Academy. And you can listen to it and people may agree or disagree but my, about how transgenders feel. But my point is that she also couldn't be her true self in the military. You know, sometimes if you can't be your true self and the culture is that way, you're going to have to leave. You know, if there's a co co company culture and you just don't feel like you fit in, sometimes you're not going to be the employee that changes the whole culture and you just got to leave. You've got to find where you fit in. But I guess, encourage your employees to find where they feel like they can fit in authentically. So, you know, authenticity can be learned. And one of the things that I think we have to do as authentic leaders is be self-aware. We need to listen. We need to be curious. In times like this, we have to really over-communicate. I was talking to my roommate from the Naval Academy. Um, she's pretty high up in the Federal Reserve Bank. And she was saying that she's a little stressed because all of her people are all over the country and how does she really interact with them and she's got to be strong. And I called her out on that because why does she have to be strong all of the time? If you are strong as a leader, if you're acting like you're strong all the time when you're, when you're going through some challenges too, then that doesn't give anybody else that works for you permission to be themselves or to admit that they're having a, an issue. I, one other thing I wanted to say, and then maybe we can get into some discussion quickly is, um, I was at, I, I do mentoring for veterans through Veterati and I was mentoring this veteran today and he was asking about the, you know, authentic leadership and stuff like that. And, and he's a senior person getting ready to transition in two more years. He's got 18 years in and he said, you know what, I get it because if I can't admit that I'm struggling with something or having issues, then how can the the, the first, the, the person that's 18 years old that just came in be themselves and admit that they've got, you know, an issue. So it, it starts at the leadership level. And so listening, getting curious, over communicating, you don't always have to be strong, be honest and sincere. If you don't know the answers, say you don't know the answers. I think employees respect uh, people for that. And just pause and take a deep breath and then also spend some time reflecting every day on how you, how you could be better. And um, 
I'm not talking at you guys. I'm just saying this is something we all can do, me too. Um, so right now, um, rumors aren't helpful, uncertainty is not helpful, but as an authentic leader, you can acknowledge the uncertainty, you can acknowledge the rumors, you could start every meeting with people going around the room at saying what their number is, just as a start. So that's all. Well, Emily, that really ties in a lot to what Brian Butler talked to us about a couple of weeks ago about the need to communicate, but to communicate in an effective way. Yeah. And the other thing that comes to my mind is you can't, you have to share the right amount of information with your people, but you also can't lose it in front of them. That's true. There's a balance. And he used the word paralyzed. And I guess I wanted to call on some of the people in the audience and see what, what they think. And Russ, I'd like to start with you. Um, did you have situations that, that you feel like um, you could say this worked and this one didn't? Uh, absolutely, because the, the this idea of being being authentic and open and clear on what you're dealing with has a significant impact on how you lead the people around you because they're they're watching you. And so, what I took from 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 Emily, one of the things that I grasped upon was this idea of productivity. And productivity has that personal aspect that goes to your self esteem. It has the professional aspect of not only your performance, but the performance of your people when you're in a high leadership role. And then it goes to what is permitted. And I, I was sharing with Emily that I had a two-star who poked me in my chest and said, you need to act like an 06 because I wasn't doing things the way they were traditionally done from a leadership perspective. But I was getting results. So I was happy with it. I was close to retirement. So it was okay that I kind of just didn't, didn't even uh, address it. But imagine if I was a, a major or a lieutenant colonel and I still had aspirations for a career ahead of me, you know, what would my reaction have been had that happened early in my career? And I always said I would have left. Had I, had I run into that type of individual early in my career, I would have left um, because authenticity is, is important to me. Well, I can, I can understand that. The other one that comes to mind is a guy named Chris Strickland, who was a Thunderbird that ejected and survived. And he's written a book um, called about that survivor's obligation. And what he said is he went through this, they took him to the hospital, they let him out of the hospital. And when his wife came to pick him up, she looked him in the eyes and said, something's wrong. And he said, what? She said, you're shorter than me. You've never been shorter than me. And he said, there was no um, counseling or anything like that. And what, what concerns me about that is like all these little triggers that are supposed to help us notice the number one thing you want to do is not let anybody know that you're struggling. We've been trained not to do that. And I feel like whether it's in the military or wherever it is, if you have a sign of weakness, certain people in an organization are going to look for a way to get you out of that because mm -hmm. they don't want to deal with that. We look at federal contracting as an area where relationships are so key. And um, especially during this time of COVID, I know my communication style has changed a certain amount because I feel like it's given me the excuse to go ahead and check up on people more than I might otherwise. And so that's, that's what I've been doing. At the same time, I think about what people's feelings are and they are really not very likely to tell me truthfully where they are, but I do tend to look at it in terms of, um, it might not be what's your number, one, two, three, four, or five, but um, somebody texted me the other day and they said, well, they've been going through something tough. And I said, well, was it an Eeyore moment? Because it's one thing to be persistently like that when you know that's not the way they are. And I feel like the other thing that all of this relates back to is we're just now realizing how much of our, our um, leadership role impacts other people and how bad energy spreads to other people. If you're upbeat all the time, that's great. But at the same time, you've got to be authentic about it and not faking it because people sense it. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering um, what, else you, what else comes to mind with that, Emily? Well, I wanted to say I interviewed Chris. I haven't published it yet. I was dumbfounded that as a Thunderbird, he had to eject from his plane. His plane crashed and he never was asked if he needed any help or counseling or directed to go to counseling, nothing. They didn't even talk about it. 